ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد then to continue with al aqida tahawiya the creed compiled by Imam Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi rahimahullah with the explanation of Shaykh Salih al-Fawzan hafizahullah then last time we had the points 156 to 158 which were wala min ummati muhammadin وَلَا نَرَى الْخُرُوجَ عَلَىٰ أَئِمَّتِنَا وَوُلَاتِ أُمُورِنَا وَإِنْ جَارُوا And we do not hold using the sword against anyone from the Ummah of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم except upon those it becomes obligatory to use the sword upon. And we do not hold rebelling against our rulers and those in authority over our affairs, even if they oppress. And with regard to questions about what we had, then who can remember an evidence that it is not lawful to shed the blood of the Muslims? Who can remember an evidence for this? That it's not lawful to shed the blood of the Muslims. <laughs> no. no doubt, as the brother mentioned, this is something important that we should. Uh, we should certainly learn something the like of this, something as important as that, that the shedding of the blood, the blood of the Muslims is forbidden. We should know that point for certain, and then we should at least know some evidence for it. And an evidence that we had, as the brother mentioned, was the hadith reported by al-Bukhari and Muslim that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned, I have been commanded to fight the people until they bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. Until they say, he said, until they say, La, none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. And if they say it, then their blood and their property is rendered secure from me, except with its right. And their reckoning will be with Allah. And likewise, the hadith that your blood, the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the khutbah on the day of Minna, the day of sacrifice in Minna, that your blood and your wealth and your persons are haram, inviolable for you, may not be violated, just like the inviolability of this day of yours, in this month of yours, in this land of yours. Hadith also reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And with regard to the second question, who can remember the three cases in which it is, or the three cases in which the blood of a Muslim can be spilled? In which three cases? What are the three exceptions to this rule? The, the adulterer, yeah. um, a life for a life, yeah. and the one who was prostrating the woman. Yeah, mashallah. The, the, the adulterer who, who is or has been married, the one who commits fornication when he's, he's already married or has been married, a life for a life, meaning a murderer when he's inheritors and his family, they demand that he be executed. And likewise, the apostate. When he apostates from Islam, then he's killed. We also, we had a reason that those people who rebel against the Muslim ruler, those who rebel, they're within the land of Islam, they're within the land of Islam, and for one reason or another, they rebel against the ruler. Then we had the point that they are to be fought against. For what reason? Why are they fought against? Yeah, in, yeah. 
basically to stop, obviously to stop their rebellion, to stop them splitting the unity of the Muslims, to, to bring about and to preserve the unity of the Muslims, to stop their evil, to stop their rebellion, which will split the unity of the Muslims. Who can remember an evidence from the Qur'an for the major, major principle of obedience to the Muslim rulers? Who can remember an ayah from the Qur'an proving the, the obligation of obedience to the Muslim rulers? from Surah Nisa the brother mentioned who can remember a hadith in, in the same regard a hadith showing the obligation of, obliga of obeying the Muslim ruler a hadith, we had a hadith in that regard as well yeah yeah that's one another one another evidence And likewise the hadith that we had as well, that whoever obeys the ruler, then he has obeyed me. And whoever disobeys the ruler, then he has disobeyed me. Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. We, a question then, if the Muslim rulers become guilty of many sins, they reach a certain level of, of committing many sins, they, they commit many sins, then does it become, they commit many sins, and they commit evils, does it, does it become permissible to rebel against them? If we see that they're, 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 they're corrupt, they're committing many sins and evils, does it become permissible to rebel against them, to try and get rid of them, and to put some better rulers in their place? Is that permissible? Is it not permissible? No, it's not permissible. As long as they're Muslim rulers, it's not permissible. And that being the position of the Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the position of the people of the Sunnah and the Jama'ah. That's the Sunnah, and that's in order to preserve as well. One of the wisdoms behind that is to preservation of the blood of the Muslims. For rebelling would only lead to bloodshed. We also had the point that the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila, they have a certain view about rulers like that, about rulers who are wicked, or rulers who are oppressive. What was the view of the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila about rulers like that? Muslim rulers who are oppressive, and commit sins, commit evil acts. What, what did the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila hold about them? Further, clever, any further point? Any? From, from, the, from the point of Akhidah for the Khawarij, they must fight against the ruler. Yeah. Then the point, the brother made the first point that if, if the sins which, they, which the rulers commit are major sins, then in the, with the Khawarij they hold that they've left Islam. And the Mu'tazila hold that they've left Islam, or the Khawarij hold that they've left Islam and become unbelievers. The Mu'tazila hold that they've left Islam and they're stuck in a halfway stage between the two floors between Islam and Kufr. And both of them hold that they're outside Islam and should be, should be rebelled against. And even if these sins do not reach the level of being major sins, it's just that the rule is committing different sins, and then the, the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila hold that they should be rebelled against. Who can remember the five fundamental principles of the Mu'tazila? Obviously, we, we only... We only bother to learn the like of the, these deviant principles so that we recognize, we recognize the evil of it and so that we avoid it. As Hudayfa radiallahu anh mentioned, the people used to ask in the hadith in Bukhari, the people used to ask about good and I used to ask about evil for fear that it would reach me. And then as the famous saying is mentioned, that we, 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 learn, the, we learn the evil, not for evil's sake, but in order to avoid it. 
So who can remember the five fundamental principles of the Mu'tazila? Or at least some of them. One of them is the Tawheed. They deny the attributes, meaning that they deny the attributes of Allah. Yeah. Because they say that if you affirm the attributes, then it means that there's multiple gods. Yeah. First one, which they, they call Tawheed, which is denying Allah's attributes. Their definition of Tawheed. Uh, tawheed, which they say, denying Allah's attributes. They say because affirming, mu affirming multiple attributes means you, you've affirmed multiple lords who are worshipped. I can remember another principle from Mu'tazila. Another false principle from them. Justice. Yeah, just the, the principle adult justice, which means what? What they or what they mean by justice? Denying yeah, denying pre-decree. They say they believe in justice, what they call justice, which means to deny pre-decree, to deny that Allah pre-decreed the affairs. Because they say that would be injustice, that would be forcing the people. That's injustice, they say. Who can remember any more principles from the Mu'tazila? Or to make it a bit easier then, who can remember what they say? One of their principles is ordering the good, ordering the good and forbidding the evil. When they say that, what do they mean by that? When the Mu'tazila, they say we order the good and forbid the evil, this is our principle, what, what do they mean by that? Yeah, they mean rebellion. I mean khuruj, rebellion against the Muslim rulers. Remaining, remain, two principles remaining. We, one already came in one of the one of the brothers already mentioned one of them. Yeah, one, one of their most famous principles that they inno that they innovated was al manzila bain al manzila tain. That they say a Muslim who commits major sin. Then he's gone outside Islam, but he hasn't entered into kufr. He's in the halfway stage, some halfway position, non-existent halfway stage, a position between the two positions. He's neither is he in Islam, nor is he in unbelief. He's in the middle. And if he dies upon that, he'll be on the hellfire forever, they say. And the last one... And the last principle is enforcing the textual threats. They say any threat in the book of the Sunnah, or obviously the, we would say in the book of the Sunnah, they, say, they would say in the Quran. Then they say any threat mentioned there, it must be enforced by Allah. Allah has to enforce it. So if anyone, is, if anyone does a major sin for which there is a threat of hellfire, then for certain they are going to receive the hellfire. Then before moving on, So this week's part, then a clarification with regard to the question, a question came up, what's the difference between, obviously Sheikh of Fawzan, he mentioned those whose blood can be shed from the Muslims, and he explained them. He mentioned the three mentioned in the hadith, the person who is, who is or has been married, who commits fornication, zina, then he is executed, the Muslim who, who murders another Muslim, then he's executed. And thirdly, the apostate, the one who leaves Islam. Then he's executed. And then he mentioned two other cases. He said, firstly, the person of Baghi, the, Bug the Bugat, those who rebel, those who within the lands of Islam, they rebel against the rulers. And they take up arms and rebel against the Muslim rulers. And then he mentioned another, another case, those who are like highway robbers or brigands. Somebody asked a question, what was the difference between the Khawarij and the Bughat, the, those who just rebel in the Muslim lands? Let me mention briefly that the Khawarij have their own beliefs. What they do is based upon belief that the rulers are outside Islam, they've left Islam, and they're the sect described by the Prophet wasallam. And as for the people of Baghi, the Bughat, then they're people who for one or another reason just happened to rebel against the Muslim rulers. They go out and rebel against the Muslim rulers. Then my answer didn't clarify, rather it made probably confused, between two sets of people. The, the two last sets of people Sheikh Al-Fawzan mentions. The people who are Bugat, rebels, and the last group, the brigands or the highway robbers. So, in actual fact, no doubt there is a distinction between those two groups. Just as Sheikh Al-Fawzan made a distinction between those last two groups, 
the rebels, Ahlu Baghi, those who rebel against Muslim rulers, take up arms, and just the highway robbers, those who set, set out to rob and plunder the Muslims. Sheikh al Fawzan, in his book, his explanation of Zad al Mustaqni, in the last volume, volume 4, Sheikh al Fawzan explains the difference between these two groups of people those who are the Ahlu Baghi, those who in the Muslim land, they rebel against the ruler, take up arms and fight, and the other group who are the highway robbers. He said, <clears throat> first he mentions, or obviously he mentioned the text of the book. It's mentioned in Zad al the chapter of fighting against the rebels, Ahlul Baghi. And they say in the text, if a people who have strength and force go out, rebel against the ruler with some sort of interpretation, then they are Bughat, they are rebels. Sheikh Al Fawzan said in explanation of this point, he said, He said, as for the Burat, the rebels, then they are those people who have three characteristics. First, that they are large in number. Secondly, that they have strength and force. They have a number and they have military preparation. And thirdly, that they have some sort of possible interpretation, meaning they have some sort of interpretation to explain to themselves why they're rebelling against the Muslim ruler. In themselves, they've got some explanation for that, some reason that to their minds it justifies their rebellion. So these three things, that there are many in number, it's not just one person or two, two friends who stand in the street with a sword, rather that they are, have a number of people, that they have strength and force, military pr preparedness, weapons, and thirdly, that they have some sort of possible interpretation for what they're doing, for their rebellion. Then Sheikh Al-Fawzan said, so if one of these characteristics is missing, then they are qutta tariq, then they are highway robbers. They are brigands or highway robbers. I mean, then they fall into the last category. And what is meant by possible interpretation which they have means that they've got some doubt which they use as evidence for what they are doing and which they think permits them to rebel against the ruler when in actual fact it is not so. I mean, they think it's justified cause what they, they've got but in reality it's not justified. So that's the distinction between those last two groups. If they have those three characteristics, they're large in number, they've got weapons and the like and they've got strength, and they rebel against the Muslim ruler based upon some interpretation, some possible interpretation which they've got. And they're counted, if they've got all these three characteristics, they're counted as Bughat, rebels, who should be fought to repel and stop their evil and to preserve Muslim unity. And if anything from that is missing, then they're just a bunch of brigands. If it's just two people standing at the side of the road shooting rifles, then they're, they're highway robbers. Or if what they're doing is just to make make money for themselves, that's the reason that they're doing. They, they, there's quite a lot of lot of them. They've got some weapons and things, but they're only doing it to rob the people. Then they're highway robbers and so on. And if they gather all three characteristics, then they are bughat. Then, with regard to today's points, continuing on the same topic of obedience to the Muslim rulers, Imam Al Tahawi, rahimahullah, he said. وَلَا نَدْعُوا عَلَيْهِمْ Point number 159 وَلَا نَدْعُوا عَلَيْهِمْ And we do not make supplication against them. And we do not make dua, supplication against them, meaning against the Muslim rulers. Shaykh al-Fawzan said, It is not permissible to make dua, to make supplication against them. 
since this falls under the meaning of rebellion. It falls under the meaning of rebellion. Like rebelling against them with weapons. And a person makes supplication against them because he does not hold them to be valid rulers. So what is obligatory? So he's mentioned what is forbidden. Forbidden to make du'a against the Muslim rulers, to make supplication against them, because that's a type of rebellion. Then he said, so what is obligatory? Is to make du'a, to make supplication for them, not against them, for them. For their guidance and rectification. They should be guided and put right. Not to make du'a supplication against them. So this is a fundamental principle from the fundamentals of the people of the Sunnah and the Jama'ah. So if you see anyone making du'a, making supplication against those in authority, then you should know that he is dal fi aqidatihi, that he is astray in his aqidah. He's astray in his creed and belief. And he is not upon the methodology of the Salaf. And some people may take this, I mean this principle, that we don't make du'a against the rulers, that we make du'a for them. He said some people may take this to be a case, or rather the opposite, making du'a against them. Some people try and justify it, making du'a against the rulers. He said, some people may take this to be a case of having jealousy and anger for the sake of Allah, the mighty and majestic. In other words, some of those who do this, they make supplication against Muslim rulers, they make big du'as, whether it's from the minbar or wherever, they make big du'as against the rulers, to, to explain what they're doing, they say, we, we have jealousy for Islam. We hate what they're doing and look what they're doing. We, have, we are jealousy for Allah. We are angry for Allah's sake. So that's why we make dua against the rulers. Sheikh Al-Fawzan said, however, it is jealousy and anger not in its right place. Not in its right place. Because if they are removed, I mean, if those rulers are removed, then it results in evil consequences. And he said, mentioning a statement from one of the Imams, he said, Imam Al Fudail ibn Iyad, Rahimahullah, he said, and he related it from Imam Ahmad. He himself said it, and he also reported from Imam Ahmad that he said, لو أني أعلم أن لي دعوة مستجابة لصرفتها للسلطان. He said, if I knew that I had a du'a, a supplication, which was going to certainly be answered, I would make it for the ruler. This was a statement of Al-Qadhi Iyad. And likewise of Imam Ahmad, he said, if I knew that I had one supplication which would definitely be answered, I would make it for the ruler. Then Shaykh al-Fawzan said, and Imam Ahmad had patience during the trial, during the mihna. Obviously highlighting the point that Imam Ahmad who made this statement, he lived through the time of those rulers who forced the people in the mihna, the trial, the trial of the creation of the Qur'an, the trial of the saying, the false saying, that the Qur'an is created. When they forced the people upon that, whipped the people and killed some of the people to try and make them say, the Qur'an is created. And yet, as Imam uh, Sheikh Fawzan said, Imam Ahmad, he had, so they were the rulers he was dealing with, 
Sheikh Fawzan said. So Imam Ahmad had patience during the trial. And it is not established from him that he made any supplication, any dua against them. Or that he spoke against them. Rather, he had patience. And the final outcome was in his favor. This is the position of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. In other words, Imam Ahmad, even though he had rulers over him who were call calling the people, trying to f and forcing the people, imprisoning the people, lashing the people, even killing some of them to try and force them to say this word of kufr that the Quran has created, yet Imam Ahmad still made the like of these statements. If I had a supplication which I knew would be answered, I would make it on behalf or for the favor of the ruler. I would make it in favor of the ruler. Then Shaykh al Fawzan said, So those who make supplication, make dua against those in authority of the affairs of the Muslims, they are not upon the position of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And likewise, those people who do not supplicate for them. This is a sign that they have deviation away from the aqidah, the creed and belief of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So here, Shaykh Fawzan highlights two groups of people who he mentions have a sign of deviation in their, in their creed and belief. First group are those who, who make supplication, make dua against the Muslim rulers. And then a second group as well, not only that, those who won't make any dua in favor of the Muslim rulers. They just say, well, okay, I won't make dua against them, but I'm not going to make any dua for them. Likewise, as the Sheikh said, that is a sign of their devi deviation in their aqidah, away from the aqidah of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that they don't make dua for the rulers. So it's not enough that we don't make dua that we don't make dua against them, rather we must make dua for them. Then Shaykh Fawzan said And some people criticize those who make supplication in the Jumu'ah Khutbah for the Muslim for those in authority of the affairs. Some people criticize them for making dua for those in authority of the affairs. And they say, this is flattery. This is hypocrisy, they say. And this is just seeking to gain favor with them. Shaykh Fawzan said, subhanallah, how, per how perfect is Allah, how f free Allah is from all imperfections. This is the position of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. In making dua for the rulers, that is the position of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Indeed, from the Sunnah is to make dua supplication for those in authority of the affairs. Since if they are rectified, then the people become rectified. So you should make dua for them, for rectification and guidance and good. You should make dua for the Muslim rulers, for those things, that they be rectified, be guided, and be put upon good. Even if they have some evil, then as long as they are upon Islam, then they have good with them. So as long as they apply the Islamic legislation, and establish the prescribed punishments and safeguard security and they prevent transgression against the Muslims and repel the unbelievers from them then this is tremendous good all of these things are tremendous good so supplication is to be made for them on account of that And whatever sins and wicked acts they have, then the sin is upon them. 
However, they have tremendous good and supplication for their uprightness and rectification is to be made for them. So this is the position of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This is the position of the people of the Sunnah and the Jama'ah. And as for the position of the people of misguidance and the people of ignorance, then they hold that this is flattery and seeking favor from them. And they do not make supplication for them. Rather, they make supplication against them. They make dua against them. Then Shaykh al-Fawzan comments upon their justification for what they do, making dua against the Muslim rulers. But they say it's a case out because we are jealous for it, for Islam. So Shaykh al-Fawzan said, And jealousy for Islam does not lie in making supplication against them. So if you truly wish for good, then make dua, make supplication for them. For rectification and good. So Allah is able to guide them and to turn them back to the truth. So you, have you despaired of their becoming guided? Then this is despairing of the mercy of Allah and also making supplication for them, for the rulers. Making supplication for them is from an nasiha It is from sincerity and sincere advice. Just as he, alayhi salatu wassalam, said, and Shaykh al-Fawzan quotes the hadith, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, ad-deenun nasiha, ad-deenun nasiha, ad-deenun nasiha. The religion is sincerity and sincere advice. The religion is sincerity and sincere advice. The religion is sincerity and sincere advice. We said, the companion said, we said, to who, O Messenger of Allah? He said, to Allah, lillahi, وَلِكِتَابِهِ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِأَعِمَّةِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَعَامَّتِهِمْ He said, For Allah and His Book and His Messenger and for the rulers of the Muslims and for their common folk. The hadith, as I mentioned in the footnote, reported by Muslim. You'll find it there in the book of Iman. The, fir the first book in Muslim, the book of Iman. And also reported by Al-Bukhari in a chapter heading in the book of Iman. And it's from a hadith of Tamim Ad-Dari radiallahu an. Shaykh al-Fawzan said, So this is a tremendous principle and it is obligatory to give attention to it. Particularly in these times particularly in these times. So then, after mentioning the point that we do not make supplication against the Muslim rulers, rather we make dua for them, then at tahawi rahimahullah, he brings point number 160 here. yadan min And we do not remove a hand from obedience to them. And we do not remove a hand from obedience to them. Shaykh al-Fawzan said, وَلَا نَنْزِئُ يَدًا مِنْ طَاعَتِهِمْ And we do not remove a hand from obedience to them. He said, this is to emphasize what preceded. So even if wrongdoing, transgression, sins, and major sins, which are lesser than shirk, occur from them, then still we do not remove a hand from, ob from obedience to them. And we do not rebel against them. And we do not disobey them. And he gives the evidence 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا أطيعوا الله وأطيعوا الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم سورة النساء the fourth surah ayah 59 fourth surah surah al-nisa ayah 59 with the explanation O oh, you who believe obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in authority from amongst you Shaykh al-Fawzan said rather I mean if that's the case even if the rulers have got sins commit evils, wrongdoing, transgression, even major sins which are less than shirk, we still, we, as he said, we don't remove a hand from obedience to them, we don't rebel against them, we don't disobey them. And he quoted the ayah, then he said, rather, we fight the jihad along with them. And we are present at the Jumu'ah prayers and the congregational prayers and the Eid prayers along with them in order to maintain the unity of the Muslims. And with regard to the next point, which continues, then at -taha, point number 161, then at Tahawi, Rahimahullah says, وَنَرَى طَاعَتَهُمْ مِن طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فَرِيدَةً مَا لَمْ يَأْمُرُوا بِمَعْصِيَةً And we hold that obedience to them is a part of obedience to Allah, the Mighty and Majestic, an obligation, as long as they do not command with something sinful. Shaykh al-Fawzan said, He the Most High said, and he quotes the same ayah as evidence again. He said, He the Most High say, said, Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu ati'u Allah wa ati'u al-rasul wa uli al-amari minkum. Surah An-Nisa, the fourth surah, ayah 59. With the explanation, O oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority from amongst you. Shaykh al-Fawzan said, so Allah has commanded obedience to those in authority from the Muslims. And as for the unbeliever, and he mentions a different case, as for the unbeliever, then there is no obedience to him due upon the Muslims. In the ayah, it mentions, وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ And those in authority from amongst you, in the Muslim rulers. He says, and as for the unbeliever, then there's no obedience due upon the Muslim, there's no obedience to him due upon the Muslims. And he gives an evidence. The ayah, وَلَنْ يَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ سَبِيلًا Surah An-Nisa, the fourth surah, ayah 141, with the explanation, and Allah will not give the unbelievers a way over the believers. Allah will not give the unbelievers a way over the believers. And Shaykh al Fawzan said, because he said, referring back to the first ayah, because he said, Wa ulil amari minkum. Ayah 59 from Surah Nisa with the explanation, and those in authority from amongst you, minkum, meaning from the Muslims. I mean, that's who it's obligatory to obey, the Muslim rulers, the rulers who are from the Muslims. Then Shaykh al-Fawzan said, so it is obligatory to obey them unless they command with something sinful. For then, there is no obedience to any created being in disobedience to Allah. So do not obey him in that sin. I mean, if the ruler commands you with something that is a sin, he said, do not obey him in that sin. However, it does not mean that you revolt against him and that you abandon obedience to him altogether. 
Rather, just do not obey him in that sin, but obey him in whatever is besides it. From that which is not a sin. And he, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam said, إِنَّمَا طَاعَةُ فِي الْمَعَرُوفِ Obedience is just due in that which is good. In a footnote, they mentioned reported by Al Bukhari as Hadith 4340 and 7145 and reported by a Muslim. And it's from a Hadith of Ali radiallahu an. It's part of a long Hadith with an incident. Within the Hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, إِنَّمَا طَاعَةُ فِي الْمَعْرُوفِ Obedience is just in that which is good. And with regard to the final point here, point number 162, which continues, then At-Tahawi, rahimahullah, said, وَنَدْعُوا لَهُمْ بِالصَّلَاحِ وَالْمُعَافَاتِ And we make supplication for them that they be rectified and kept secure. I mean, for the Muslim rulers, and we make supplication for them that they be rectified, they be put, put in a good condition and be kept secure. Shaykh al Fawzan said, We make supplication, we make dua to Allah that He returns them to the truth and that He corrects whatever errors they have. We make dua supplication for them that they be rectified because their being rectified is rectification for the Muslims and their becoming guided is guidance for the Muslims and their benefit passes on to others so if you make supplication dua for them I mean for the rulers then you have supplicated for the Muslims Alhamdulillah wa sallallahu ala Muhammad. Any points of clarification? As for a ruler committing shirk, then if the ruler commits shirk, meaning if he commits <coughs> major shirk, which takes a person outside the fold of Islam, leaving aside what the Khawarij say, obviously the Khawarij, they point their finger on the, the, the fools and the ignorant, they point their finger and they, they call all sorts of things shirk, and they make all sorts of declarations that so-and-so has left Islam. Anybody who doesn't agree with their, their views, they declare him outside Islam. So ignoring that, leaving their position aside, then if a Muslim ruler, the principle is, as came before, if the principle is if a Muslim ruler leaves Islam, truly leaves Islam, then as the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned, when the companions asked him about, when the, he mentioned the, how e, the most evil of rulers, when the companion asked you would rebel against them, he said, no, illa an tarau kufran bawahan indakum min Allahi fihi burhan. Or as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, that no, unless you see clear and open kufr from them, clear and open kufr from them, for which you have a proof from Allah. You know, do something which clearly and openly, there's no, no way it can be interpreted away, it's clear and open kufr, which takes them outside of Islam, which there's evidence for. And the people, obviously the people to establish the like of this, are the scholars, the people of Islam. The scholars of Islam, they'll be the first to see this. If it's clear and open kufr, the first people to see it and know it will be the, the scholars of Islam. Then it's for the like of them if, to, to judge whether something is, is you know, so, so this rule or that rule has left the fold of Islam. It's not just that some fool on the street, he says, look, this ruler did such and such and I, hold, I think that's kufr, therefore I'm going to rebel. No, rather it's for the scholars to decide that. 
And then there comes a second point. If the scholars of Islam have, have seen, the, seen what's happened, have seen, seen the case, and they've judged that the ruler has left Islam, is no longer a Muslim. For example, he comes out and says, oh, I'm a Christian, I follow the Christian religion now, and everybody has to worship the cross and so on. For example, then the rulers, seeing that and judging that he's left Islam, then comes the second matter. Is, is there the possibility, do the Muslims have the strength the strength in their religion and the strength with the, the necessary strength to remove that leader without producing greater harm. And again, that is left to the judgment of the scholars. And if they judge that the, the Muslims don't, do not possess that, then, then there's no, the rebellion is still, they're still not rebelled against. Because it must be judged by the scholars that clearly the ruler has left Islam, firstly, and secondly, that the Muslims do have the ability to remove him without producing major bloodshed and, and, and greater evil. With those two conditions, then that's something different. Oh, yeah, come. Oh, there now it's two different people. Uh, it's, a, it's a correction of something I said then. When I first mentioned Sheikh Fawz, I mentioned a quote from Al Fudayl ibn Iyad, the great scholar of the, uh, of the Salaf, Al Fudayl ibn Iyad. And if I said Al Qadi Iyad, and that was a slip of the tongue, that was an error from me. There's two entirely separate people, two, two very different people. Al Qadi Iyad, he came much later, much later on. Al Qadi Iyad, a famous Maliki scholar who explained, wrote an, a number of books and explained Sahih Muslim and so on. That's somebody entirely different. As for Al Fudayl ibn Iyad, then he was Imam of the Salaf, Rahimahullah. As for point number 161, it was, And we hold that obedience to them is a part of obedience to Allah, the mighty and majestic, an obligation, as long as they do not command with something sinful. Obviously, the evidence for that is given by Shaykh al -Fawzan. Why is obedience to the Muslim rulers a, a part of obedience to Allah? Because Allah has commanded that we obey them. And if we disobey the rulers, then we're disobeying a part of what Allah has commanded. So we're dis disobeying Allah. In the ayah, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيءُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيءُ الرَّسُولُ وَأُولِ الْأَمَرِ مِنْكُمْ Surah al 59, with the explanation, O ye who believe, obey Allah, and obey the Messenger, and those in authority amongst you. There's no way, in no way correct for someone to come and say, I obey only Allah and the Messenger, and I don't obey the rulers. I don't obey the Muslim rulers. Then how have you obeyed Allah then, who has commanded you to obey the Muslim rulers? You have not obeyed Allah in that, in that matter. You have not obeyed the rulers, and neither therefore have you obeyed Allah. As for living in the land of the unbelievers, then obviously we live in the land of the unbelievers with the understanding that we live at, we live at peace with them. We're allowed to live in, we're allowed to live in their lands, and they allow us to, to to practice our religion on the understanding, so that it's automatic, on the, on the understanding that we don't you know disrupt their country, we don't disrupt their land, and we don't you know we don't go out and, uh, and take the sword to put the sword on their necks and the like of that. We don't blow them up and so on. If they put some sort of law down like you drive on the left-hand side of the road, then we don't just you know, disobey that and say, well, we don't have to obey them, so therefore we drive on any side of the road we like. We don't, we don't do that. Because that's, that's just, you know, just chaos and anarchy and the like. Then we're not, we don't do that. That was a bit, on, on the major point that we're living in their lands on the understanding, on certain understanding, a certain agreement that we've got with them. And if somebody doesn't like the agreement, then they should just leave the land. They're not, you're not compelled to live, to live there. And if you are, you're living there, then you live under certain, there's certain rules. Yeah. Allah. 
Allah Allah. Ask a question to a person of knowledge. Allah Allah. Specifically that. Allah Allah. Likewise, if, I mean, very, very briefly, with regard to the, those who try and say that the point that Sheikh Al-Fawzan brings here, that if the Muslim rulers are rectified, then the people are rectified. Then no doubt, of these, if the rulers are rectified, then they can have a good effect on the people. Like, for example, the rulers in Saudi at the moment. We want to preserve them. Then they have a good, no doubt, they have a good effect on the society. They can implement in the society that Tawheed is taught in the schools, that the Sunnah is taught in the schools, that Bid'ah is kept out of the country, that nobody's allowed to propagate innovation, nobody's allowed to pr propagate shirk, nobody's allowed to rebuild to the, the tombs over the graves and the like. So no doubt the rulers, if they're rectified, they have an, uh, an enormous effect upon that land and even upon other lands throughout the earth. So no doubt that's that, the point that Sheikh al Fawzan made is true. But then to try, and, to try and turn that into something like some people do, they say, yes, therefore, our call, our prime call, should be with regard to the rulers. And what they mean by that is that we call for the downfall of these rulers. These rulers are, that we have, they say they're corrupt. So we call, we need to bring about their downfall. And then we put our good, our good rulers in the place and then the whole of the earth will be rectified. And this is the call of the Khawarij, the call for rebellion against the Muslim rulers rebellion against them and bringing their downfall. This is the call of the Khawarij. And likewise, the call of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he began in Mecca, he didn't begin in the way that they called, called to begin, that we concentrate upon the rulers. He did not concentrate upon the certain rulers, that, you know, whoever was the heads of the Quraysh at the time, make plots to kill them or make, make plots to bring about their downfall and the like. The Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, rather, he called everybody to the Tawheed of Allah, that they make their worship purely and sincerely for Allah. That was his call. That was the call of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't just concentrate upon the rulers, let's concentrate upon the rulers, spend all our efforts in bringing about their downfall, making plots against them and the like. And the, the whole problem is the rulers. No, he called the, pe the people, whoever would listen, in which obviously in most cases it was the common people, the common people and the poor people and the slaves who listened and accepted to worship Allah alone. And likewise, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he sent Mu'adh to Yemen, he didn't say, go and find the rule, rulers and, and do such and such and such. He rather, he mentioned, you're going to a people from the people of the book, so let the first thing that you call them to be, Allah, that they make the tawheed of Allah. That they single out Allah with all worship. So that is the prime call. And an excellent, the most, one of the excellent books in this regard is the book of Shaykh Rabi, Hafidhullah, the methodology of the prophets in calling to Allah, which shows how those who those who wish to bring about rectification in the Muslim Ummah, they should begin with the call of set, which was the call of all of the prophets, the call to Tawheed, calling the people to Tawheed, and not just sitting and making polit political speeches and pointing the fingers at rulers and saying that's the problem with the Ummah, it's these rulers they're the problem. That's not the call of the of the of the Salaf, and it was not the call of the prophets. Oh yeah, come. No doubt, with regard to somebody, obviously, if, if, if somebody sees something from a ruler, which is something, uh, something evil, then the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the authentic hadith, the hadith reported by Ibn Abi Asim and others, that Shaykh al-Bani authenticated, if one of you has some advice for a person in authority, then let him take him by the hand and advise him in private. So if somebody who has the ability, somebody who has knowledge, obviously one of the conditions, one of the conditions of ordering good and one of the main conditions for ordering the good and forbidding the evil is ilm, is knowledge, is that you have knowledge. Knowledge of what the person is doing, that it is in fact, it is actually wrong. And you know what is correct, then that you've got that knowledge, you're a person of knowledge. Then if you wish to go and advise the ruler, then take, go and take him by the hand in private and advise him. 
Subhanakallah, Allah, 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 Allah,